All right, this is a crash course in teaching diagnostic reasoning. I'm Paul Bergel. I collaborate closely with my colleague Jay Patel here at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and we've put together a lot of curriculum materials locally to uh, teach diagnostic reasoning. And I wanted to put together a little bit of a crash course for people that are trying to teach this themselves, uh, both for use locally here at MCW, but perhaps elsewhere as well. So this first part is why we should teach diagnostic reasoning better. And if you've already uh, been drinking the Kool-Aid and you think diagnostic reasoning is the most important thing that we can possibly teach our learners, then you may want to skip to a different talk. So I always like to start with this quotation by Osler. Diagnosis is the foundation of clinical medicine, and it's summarized in his quotation here. Lack of systemic personal training, systematic personal training and the methods of the recognition of disease leads to the misapplication of remedies to long courses of treatment when treatment is useless and so directly to that lack of confidence in our methods, which is apt to place us in the eyes of the public on a level with empirics and quacks. So well stated. In fact, all he was saying at that point is that diagnosis drives management. And I still think that is the case in 2019. And if you don't believe me, you haven't been paying attention to what happens to your patients. So why should we explicitly teach clinical reasoning, diagnostic reasoning more specifically? Isn't this something that's already happening? Well, I don't think that it is. And here's the reason why I think we should teach it more explicitly. Because we have a lot of folks that are on this traje trajectory to expertise and mastery that run into some detours. We have early learners that become full of facts but can't seem to put things together, can't seem to reason clinically. And then we often are graduating physicians from residency programs or fellowships at this level where they're competent to proficient, but then they take this detour to being an experienced non-expert. In other words, they don't continue to cultivate their skills and reasoning toward these levels of mastery and instead are sort of stuck in their ways and don't continue to practice deliberately. And Dr. Patel and I believe that deliberate practice or reflective practice or both are keys to achieving expertise and mastery. Now, I am not an expert. I'm not a master, but I'm working toward this goal. And the way to do that is through deliberate practice. And that's the whole uh, foundation for what I'm going to be talking about in this series. So when we talk about diagnostic reasoning, we talk about a lot of different things. One type of diagnostic reasoning is simply reflexive identification. If somebody comes in with a thunderclap headache with syncope, my brain is already thinking subarachnoid hemorrhage. We also talk about mystery solving where somebody comes in with an abstract complaint and we're gathering data and we're reprioritizing our differential diagnosis. You know, so if somebody comes with alter mental status and seizures and then we go to the exam, examine them, we see, see they have dilated pupils and they're tachycardic and they're hypertensive and have a tremor and we start thinking through diagnostic possibilities. That's another type of diagnostic reasoning. Another type of diagnostic reasoning is what a lot of our colleagues in dermatology, radiology do, which are visual recognition tasks. And these are occurring in the context of clinical scenarios, but they are um, also a different type of diagnostic reasoning. Then we have what I'd call explicitly probabilistic thinking. So this is exemplified when you have somebody that comes in with a suspected pulmonary embolism and you put them into some sort of standardized, validated risk calculation score to help you make clinical decisions about them. That's explicitly probabilistic thinking and that's another type of reasoning. We also have uh, specific labeling that happens in diagnostic reasoning. So if you're an oncologist, this diagnosis of ALK positive lung cancer is uh, not only important from a diagnostic standpoint, but from a therapeutic st standpoint. So we often want very specific labeling for the diseases people have so we can guide therapeutic decision making. On the other hand, sometimes we're left with abstract classifying and sense making. Somebody comes in with nonspecific low back pain. Sometimes that's enough. And it's the process of figuring out if this is uh, back pain with alarm symptoms or not that is um, a really a different form of diagnostic reasoning. We're not necessarily assigning a label, we're just saying is this serious or not. So those are all different ways of engaging in the diagnostic process. And if you've read this beautiful paper by Judith Bowen, you're probably familiar with this terminology that the patients will present with a story, we acquire more data, we represent the problem, we generate hypotheses about what is causing the problem, we look for illness scripts in our brain to see what matches best, and we arrive at a diagnosis. And in Dr. Bowen's model, this process is somewhat linear or circular. Uh, I would argue, though, contemporary medicine, it is not bad at all. In fact, it is so nonlinear, particularly in modern medicine where patients have long paper trails, electronic records that are following them around and have so much data that's already been acquired, we are often jumping uh, back and forth between all these different types of reasoning uh, or all these different parts of the diagnostic process. So as we go through this series, I'm going to highlight how these are all interconnected and I think it's really difficult to teach these in isolation and not recognize that the diagnostic process is very liquid, very fluid, and is really not linear whatsoever. So as we think about illuminating the path to mastery, here is the model that Dr. Patel and I have decided is 
the way to think about this, we think. So we recognize that knowledge and experience obviously come with time, but they're insufficient for mastery. If you want to get learners to master diagnostic reasoning, there are probably some elements that need to be there so that we can teach them, coach them, allow them to practice deliberately. The first is learning and speaking a common language. And this is so important. Like if you were trying to pick up uh, a new instrument or a new sport and you had a coach and the coach just said, hey, play better. You're not playing very well. You're not going to learn how to get any better at that sport or that instrument. But that's pretty much what we're doing in medicine a lot when we're giving feedback. Hey, think more critically. Go read more. Get more knowledge. So if we don't speak a common language that can guide our learners what we mean when we want them to think more critically, it's going to be a dead end. The next is understanding the science of thinking. I think this is really important for those that want to teach diagnostic reasoning. Our brains work in certain ways that cognitive psychologists and other experts have worked out over many years. And if we don't think about how we think, it's really hard to start to break the mold of how we've been thinking and improve the way we're thinking. Which, of course, gets at the last point of this process, which is promoting reflection. Now, there is no single best way to solve a problem. Everybody thinks through diagnostic uh, reasoning differently. Everybody solves cases differently. But... The hope of all of this is that if we speak a common language, we understand how our brains work, that we can promote better reflection, um, not only from a coach to a learner standpoint, but also self-reflection in our learners. So the final thought I have in this first introductory part is just some humble suggestions to other teachers. First, as I said before, there is no right way to solve a case, and I think we need to recognize it. Similarly, there's no best way to teach reasoning. So I'm just going to teach you all about different ways to think about reasoning, and it's really up to, me, up to you to decide which of those meet your needs. And finally, many clinicians are already doing this well, but I think they may not be translating what they're doing. So in other words, they're thinking for their, uh, their learners, but they're not explicitly labeling parts of the reasoning process or haven't thought enough about their own thinking to be able to try to impart a way of thinking upon their learners. So that's really the purpose of this series of talks.